All right, the title of the sermon this morning is The Secret to a Good Marriage. The Secret to a Good Marriage. Now, you can apply a lot of these principles to um, just any relationship in general, but we'll talk about it in the context of a marriage when we talk about uh, examples. But, you know, when you ask yourself the question, what is a good marriage? Maybe you think of, uh, you know, it's a marriage, it's enjoyable, you know, joyful. You know, they say happy wife, happy life. Um, you know, you're content. There's maybe uh, not bitterness or, res- you know, uh, resentfulness in a marriage. Or you say a good marriage is when two people trust one another. You know, integrity, you know, you're doing what you say, you know, you're loyal um, to one another, uh, not just, you know, obviously in a... In a marriage covenant we're talking about sexual loyalty uh say a good marriage is a marriage that is peaceful one that you know is absent of conflict Uh, and we remember the movie fireproof where the concept of our marriage is not a marriage without conflict but a marriage is one that can withstand conflict so i like the concept of that movie fireproof when you fireproof something it's not that the fire doesn't come is that when the fire does come it can withstand the heat so i think it's a great analogy uh, in terms of fireproofing a marriage but you know when you think about joy you know a marriage that is joyful there's trust there's peace these are things that you experience when you have a good marriage but you know what are the secret ingredients to achieve this state because you can't just say be joyful you know have trust have peace how do you achieve those things to have a good marriage so when i teach on marriage i, I try to address what i believe are the root issues and this is also very relevant to dating because you know when you date this is what you should look for, you know, when you're talking to a potential spouse. I mean, we've all gone through the dating game. I mean, what is dating if it's not trying to find out whether these ingredients exist between you and that other person to have the sort of good marriage that people would like, but you're just trying to do it without, you know, fornication or pretending like you are married when you're not. So that's effectively what dating is. So you can, you know, take this lesson as well and, you know, apply it to dating and say, well, when I'm dating, I'm trying to find these secret ingredients between me and that person and see if that, that exists. So let's, let's talk about them. So I've got four things today that I believe are the core ingredients to having a good marriage. So number one, is you have the same beliefs and values. You have the same beliefs and values. So we start here because this is the foundation of all the other factors that contribute to a good marriage. You've got to start at that foundation. Amos 3.3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? This is one verse I always think about when it comes to any relationship, but it's specifically a marriage. Marriage is obviously the, the, the tightest of all relationships. You can have friendships, business relationships, acquaintances, all this family. You know, obviously marriage is a family type relationship, but it's, it's one of the closest, right? It's the core, it's the nucleus of the family. So can two walk together except they be agreed? You have to agree on the foundational philosophy underpinning your marriage because your marriage is built on that foundation and salvation and our Christianity is the same. That's why Jesus Christ is the foundation and then we build our works on that. It's the same way. We build our life. We build our beliefs on that foundation. We have to have that same foundation. If you don't have the same foundation, I mean, that is one recipe for constant conflict and you may be arguing at, up here but the, the, the source of all the arguments is because at the foundational level, it's not the same beliefs and values. 
This is why we started Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 4. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labour. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. So first he starts off as talking about the advantages of there being two rather than one. And, and this is, you know, kind of alluding as well to the fa fact that it's not good for the man to be alone, so it's good that there, there are two. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat, but how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. But what I want to focus on here is, it says here at the end, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now this threefold cord analogy in the Bible is often used to talk about husband, wife, and God. So yes, two is better than one because they can support one another. But the ideal scenario in a Christian marriage is that it is a threefold cord. So you have that third cord binding husband and wife together, which is God. Because unbelievers can have same values and beliefs. I mean, we know unbelievers that can have peaceful marriages, joyful marriages, because they have the same, maybe false beliefs, they have the same values, they come from the same culture. But is that the ideal that the Christian marriage is going for? No, because you're not looking just for a twofold court where you just agree with us. The ideal is it's a threefold court where the same values and beliefs are just not shared cultural values and things like that. It's a shared love for God. It's a shared um, you know, perspective, a biblical perspective, a Bible-believing perspective. So this is why when we talk about same values and beliefs, I mean, the first one we can talk about is obvious. You need the same Bible doctrine. You know, the same Bible doctrine. So you think about you know, having the same beliefs about the Bible, having the same beliefs about salvation, having the same, I can list off, I've just got a few on my mind, having the same beliefs about marriage. You know, that marriage is one woman, one man for life, and there's no just like, you know, you can just divorce whenever you want, like the courts now, no fault divorce, you just don't get along, it's not working out, you know, we're not friends anymore, and uh, we just can't seem to make this work, so then uh, we divorce. No, that's something that has to be agreed up front, that you no know, marriage, that's not how marriage works in the Bible. Marriage is one man, one woman for life, you know, better for worse, we talked about with, that, with vows. So you want to have the same beliefs about marriage, divorce, now, why is it important to have the same beliefs about the Bible, the same beliefs about salvation? Because that is how you're going to build your thinking when you talk about you know, priorities and plans and decisions. It's all going to be through the lens of the Bible. But if you don't have that same foundation, then you're going to have differing priorities and different values because the foundation is different. You know, if you have different views on doctrine, you have different views on salvation, how do you serve together? Because right? what is the point of a marriage in God's eyes? Well, it's to raise a godly family and to serve God more. This is not, marriage is not something that's just like self-serving. It's something I want to do in my life, like the world is. Oh, it's something I want to go. I want to have kids because that's something I just want to do in my life. It's like on my bucket list, you know? They treat kids a bit like, you know, going to Venice on a holiday and going to see that thing. No, oh, kids is just one other thing I do to feel like my life is more accomplished. No, we... We marry and bear children to serve God. That's the point of marriage. So we have to have that underlying shared value. So yes, one ingredient to a good marriage is having same beliefs and values. But what I'm also mentioning is for believers, for, for, for children of God, it's not just any values. We want to have biblical values and biblical beliefs. Because this doctrine is going to determine hey, what church you attend. It's going to determine how effectively you serve together. So not only biblical doctrine, Romans 12, 1. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
So, like I said, unbelievers may have same beliefs and values, but you don't want them to be worldly beliefs and values. Like you find a commonality in some worldly aspect or some, something worldly. You want to find common beliefs and values in what is righteous and what is good. Like here in Romans 12, we don't want to be conformed to this world, but we want to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We want to be different. We want to have our perspective changed so that it aligns with the Bible, not just like our upbringing, not just what the world does, not just what we like to do and what pleases our flesh. We want to do what pleases God so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So yes, can a marriage, it's still an ingredient to, a, I guess, a peaceful marriage. It's a good marriage, but you know, is, a good, is a good marriage an ungodly marriage? You know, filled with worldliness, filled with just, you know, prioritizing the self-serving and just living for yourself and just living for your pleasure and life and whatever you want to do. Can we really call that a good marriage? So that's why when we talk about a good marriage, it's also a godly marriage, isn't it? One, one that is godly, not worldly. What about the same beliefs and values about the roles within the family? You see how if you can't agree on the roles of husband and wife. You're going to have differing expectations. Ephesians 5, God makes it very clear, the structure of the family. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. And when it comes to any type of conflict, when things are going well, you know, conflict principles doesn't really matter. I was talking with a friend recently, you know, and she was telling me, you know, because, uh, you know, she's kind of like liberal Christian, you know, so it's Christian, not really Christian, agrees with some things. I believe she's saved, but, you yeah, know, it doesn't take everything in the Bible and applies it in her life. So we're talking and she was saying, you know, well, me and my husband, we don't, we don't really fight that much, so we don't really have to have this, like, you know, submission and whatnot, you know, like the Bible talks about. And I was saying, you know, when, when everything's peaceful, it doesn't really matter. You know, when everything's, when there's nothing to, when there's nothing to disagree over, then the, then the authority structure doesn't matter. And then I said to her, but what, the question is, what happens when you do have a difference of opinion and you do disagree? Then the question is, who's meant to submit to the other? And I said to her, well, in, according to the Bible, you have to submit to what your husband wants. In that instance, if there's never any clash, well, then you've never actually tested this principle in your marriage. When it, when it goes through the fire, like we talk about the fire, when we go through the fire, is it fireproof in the sense you have the same idea of how the roles work so that that conflict can be resolved, right? And likewise, the other thing, if the, if the family is like not in order, not spiritually in order, it's not provided for, well, whose fault is that? Is it because... You know, mom isn't running her home business well enough. Mom hasn't been willing to put the kids in daycare and then go, and then go to work. No, it's, it's the man's fault. It's the man's fault that the, 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 the house is not being provided for or the family's backsliding. Whose fault is that? It's the man's fault. So you can see, you can resolve these, you, you can have the right perspective on, hey, what's the root issue here? Because you have these same values and principles. So what about other sources of conflict that can happen? Ephesians 5, it says here, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So another example of having same beliefs and values that I think creates a lot of conflict is when a husband and wife have differing uh, values or beliefs on how extended family should be treated. I mean, how many conflicts happen because of that? You know, we go to mum's house, do we go to dad's house for Christmas, and this or that, or, you know, uh, kids haven't seen this, and kids haven't seen that, so, you know, so then how do we prioritise that? So you can take some of these same beliefs and values and avoid 
a lot of conflict because you see things the same way, you would handle it the same way. Usually conflict happens because of a difference in expectation, a different in beliefs and different in values. So at the foundational level, that is one ingredient, you know, one secret ingredient to a successful and good marriage. Now it's not so secret here, but you know, it, you'd be shocked, or not shocked, but you know, it's when you look out into the world and marriages that are not doing well, they, it's because at the, the foundation, they got married because they just were dating and they were just having fun together, but they did not have these same values and beliefs, right? And I think this is, this is very important. Now this is why, when we go back to talking about dating, whenever I give dating advice, I always emphasize this because I know this is so foundational to having a good marriage, is that you actually are agreed. How can two walk together except they be agreed? And this is why when people date, I say, hey, make sure you discuss as many things as possible, because what's the point of it? You're trying to get on the same page. And one thing I always say to dating couples is philosophy before intimacy. But the world has it the other way around. They date, then they start holding hands, and then they go to the movies together, and they start like you know, acting like husband and wife, sitting and cuddling and everything. And uh, do you even want to get married? Oh, I'm married, I'm not talking about that yet. Why scare her away? Why scare him away? Well, and then and you wonder why, you, you know, now you can't break up because now you're too engrossed in, intimately. Then you get married and then you have completely different foundations. You have completely different beliefs and values. And then you wonder why the rest of your life in marriage is just filled with conflict. Now, the right way to go about it is you have to establish, do we have, are we agreed? So that we can work, we can walk together because we're going to be walking together for the rest of our life. This is why it's so important. And that's why I always say, we're dating, philosophy has to lead intimacy. And in fact, intimacy shouldn't even start until it's, you settled on philosophy, then you commit to one another, and then the intimacy begins. So dating, like I said, is all about establishing whether these things actually exist so that you can build a relationship on these things and experience the things we talk about, having the joy, having the trust, having the lack of conflict. Right? Let's go on to the next one. Same beliefs and values. Number two, secret ingredient, not so secret ingredient, to a good marriage, is having shared goals. Shared goals. Now this is different. You say, isn't this a bit similar to the first one? No, because you can have the same beliefs, but that doesn't mean you have the same goals, right? A goal is what you're actually trying to achieve in your life, because you may both be Bible-believing Christians, but if the goal of the husband is to like, you know, some people have a desire to like go to another country and be in, minist uh, be in ministry over there and be like an evangelist or whatnot, then the, the woman has to ask herself, is do I share that goal? Do I want to also do that? They may not want to do that. So you have to talk about not just what your beliefs are, but what you actually want to achieve in life. What are, you, what are your goals are? So you can say, are you willing to come along this journey? Now, who should set the goals? It should be the man, right? So the woman has to decide whether or not she wants to come along for that journey. Now, unbelievers, and let's just make this comparison again, unbelievers can have shared self-serving goals as well. Maybe a husband and wife, they say, hey, we want to build this business together. You know, it's like, yeah, we're going to business and we build this business together and it's just all about, hey, we can, then uh, after we make all this money, we can, we can retire and we can and see the world and just like, you know, like, like the rich uh, fool in the Bible. We just want to take ease, eat, drink and be merry. So they can have a shared goal. So you can see how that can create a good marriage or a peaceful marriage and or not but is it is it a godly marriage is it the marriage that we sort of want no we want shared goals that pleases god so what should be some foundational shared goals of a good christian marriage matthew 2 22 36 master 
which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So the first and greatest commandment is to serve God and love your neighbour as yourself. So then what should be a shared goal of a marriage? Surely the first and greatest shared goal of a marriage should be the first and greatest commandment, which is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. So this is one way you can have a shared goal. When you have the same beliefs and values, you build your goals on the Word of God, you're going to have the shared goals because your goals are going to be coming from the Word of God. Here's another one, the Great Commission. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So that should be another shared goal between husband and wife, is, hey, are we encouraging, motivating each other to be part of, of the Great Commission, building God's kingdom, getting people saved, discipling believers, you know, teaching others what we've learned through our own growth. Because remember, what is the purpose of a marriage? Yes, we get company. Yes, we get intimacy. Yes, we get the blessing of children. But to what end? To what end is our life? When we talk about the purpose of our life, to what end? It's to serve God. Right? It's to get people saved. It's to raise a righteous family, not just for our own service, but for God's service. Malachi 2.14 Yet ye say, Wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And wherefore one? Why does he bring husband and wife together? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts, Therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. So, when you think about having shared goals, so we talked about having the same values and same beliefs, so having the same foundation so you can build this life together. The way shared goals work that was explained to me, and I like the analogy, is you have a triangle, right? And most, the world's philosophy is not. The world's philosophy is like a line where you have husband and wife and they do things to try and get closer, right? Do shared activities and all the things that the world talk, talks about, right? And I'm not saying that they're not done in a Christian marriage, but it's a different mindset. So, in, in a world's marriage, it's just husband and wife, and hopefully you do things that you get closer and closer together. But I like the analogy that was explained to me on how Christian, a Christian husband and wife get closer together. And it's more like a triangle, where you have God at the top, and you have husband and wife both seeking God. And as they get closer and closer to God, they also get closer and closer together. You see the difference? So I think that is the right perspective. You're not just, it's not, because it's not just about you two. It's not just about serving the other. Sometimes a husband and wife, like the, the other person becomes an idol. Your children can become an idol. A lot of things in life can become an idol, where that's just the most important thing to you. You do everything, everything's about that. But the way we don't have an idol and yet we still love our children, we do well at our jobs, we love our spouses, is because as we seek to please God and we get closer to God, then husband and wife also get closer together. And that's how it should work when you have shared goals. Now the husband of the family, the, the, the father of the family, is the one that should be setting the goals. 
So what's the wife's decision when you're in, in date, when it comes to dating is, do you want to come along and, and participate in this goal that is being set for the family? Now that's not saying the wife has no say in goals of the family, obviously it's a discussion. But these are things you've got to talk about before you get married. One of the problems in marriage, when you are married and you don't have shared goals, you're going to be going in different directions. Right? So obviously you're getting further apart because you have different goals, you're not on the same page in terms of what you're trying to achieve. And this sometimes manifests in the whole, oh, it, it's it, the whole, oh, is it going to be that thing or me? You know when, when that happens in marriages where, oh, you're always doing this thing, uh, you don't do it with me. And I'm not saying it's like only females, but you know, men as well. You know, it's just when somebody's so engrossed in a goal that it, that, that it becomes like a, I'm competing with this priority in this person's life. But why does that occur? That occurs because you don't share the goal. Because if you share the goal, you will see yourself as both on the same team supporting that goal. Not he's doing his thing, she's doing his thing and not doing it. Because it's because you don't share the same goals. That's why there's a competition of goals now. But if you share the same goal, that conflict doesn't happen because the, you have the benefit of the doubt that they're working to achieve that goal and I'm supporting, why supporting that goal and you're working together as a team as opposed to opposition. So the husband should set the goal. Why? Because the woman is the helper of the husband. Genesis 2, all the way at the beginning of our Bible, chapter 2. The Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So I like to just point this out because all, all my young Christian life, I mean, I, I got saved at 18, 19, but everybody talked about the wife as a help meet. And I know you guys don't, but every time I read this verse and people say, oh, God made a help meet for Adam. Help meet is not the word, okay? It, it's, it's not a help meet now. It's a help that is suitable for him. So it's a helper, right? So there's no word help me. That's just something that a lot of Christians say. They get it from this verse. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And I won't read the rest for the sake of time because we know he made woman. He says, now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. My point here is, in Genesis 2, is the woman was made to help the man. So that is the right perspective that Christians should have when setting goals for the family. That the man should decide the goals for the family and then the woman should be supporting and helping the family in the goals that have been set. So... When you have shared goals, it creates a common expectation of what happens, of, of, of what marriage life is like and the purpose of your marriage. So, so what is prioritized? How to run your home? How to raise your family? What ministries you're going to dedicate time to and, 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 and commit to? Your, the, the husband's career, right? because it's about you know, career is an important part of like how to make money. So that's going to, you know, that's a, that has to be a shared goal. Where to live. Maybe your standard of living. That's a shared goal as well. You, know, if you, have, to, you have to agree on these things, what the acceptable standard of living is and get on the same page there. All right, so two ingredients so far. One is same beliefs and values. Second one is shared goal. Number three, secret to a good marriage is communication. Communication. Now, good communication is key to understanding one another because talking is the only way to know another person's thoughts. You know, I know a lot of people think they have some intuition, but they just know what people are thinking based on what they do. But you know, this is where a lot of misunderstanding happens because misunderstanding happens when you assume and you make an ass out of you and me. That's what I assume means. So the best way to know what somebody is thinking is you've got to talk. So there needs to be communication. Now, talking takes time. So because talking takes time, 
in order for communication to be in a relationship, you need to be proactive. You need to make that time. You need to make the time to talk because talking takes time. And if you don't talk, there's going to be this bottling up of emotions. And that's what leads to bitterness, resentment. That's what makes a conflict bigger than it needs to be because all that emotion and that resentment is built up and it's not communicated. It's not worked out because talking is how you must reveal these things and only once it's revealed can you resolve it and it needs to be resolved through talking as well. So I firmly believe that couples should discuss everything. But one thing I want to say different today because I've said this many times before that couples should discuss everything is a lot of talking is also a double-edged sword. Because why is that? Proverbs 10, 19. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. But he that refraineth his lips is wise. So when a lot of talking happens, the more talking that happens, the, the more increased chance that offence can happen and things can be said that shouldn't be said and whatnot. So I don't want that to take away from what I firmly believe is good, which is a lot of talking needs to happen and communication so that you get on the same page. And that needs to be there. But I think one thing that needs to be pointed out is a lot of talking can also lead to additional conflict if it's not done with the principles that the Bible teaches us and with the care that it's done, uh, that the Bible teaches us about the dangers of the tongue. James 3, 5. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. Now, this is a problem amongst people that are familiar with one another because when you're more familiar with one another, you're a bit more loose with your tongue. Think about when you don't know somebody that well or there's somebody you don't have a very close relationship with, you're a lot more careful with the things you say. Now, it's still ideal in that scenario that you can talk about those things, but you're a lot more careful because you know, people take offence a lot easier when you don't know them that well. So this is why, even though I firmly believe you know, couples should talk about a lot of things, it doesn't mean that you throw the principles of how you should communicate with people out the window. But that's a risk that happens, especially in a marriage, because why? Marriage is like the closest relationship. You're like the most familiar. You take each other the most for granted that you will just lack, you know, uh, just carelessly just throw things out and cause all this damage because the tongue is still a fire and it's set on the course of hell and that can happen in any relationship as well. So the caveat I want to give and want to make clear today is yes, talk about everything. But that doesn't mean you throw out the principles of how we should talk. What, you know, Proverbs say, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well advised is wisdom. So do we go into conversation humble, with humility? Humility is about, you know, coming gentle, giving people the benefit of the doubt, not being offended when things are said, not being you know, angry when things are said, because you're humble about it so that you, you know, you, you're both not just, you know, the egos just, you know, keep increasing until it's just a, a fire that can't be put out. Ephesians 4.15, but speaking the truth in love, they grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So the way we talk. Colossians 4.6, I won't spend too much time on these because they're very familiar to us. The point I'm making is don't throw these things out. There's a danger of disregarding these principles with people that you are too familiar with and you inflame a situation because you, want to, you need to talk about these things but it gets worse because these principles are not being heeded to or considered when you talk to one another. Colossians 4, 6, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So you've got to practice the same principles as with any communication but communication is, is a key ingredient to a, to, to a good marriage. You can't have a good marriage if you cannot talk to one another. And if you follow the principles in the Bible of how to communicate, and, and these other having the same values, having shared goals, 
Obviously, these come together to make a good marriage. And the last one I want to talk about, number four, which I believe is a critical secret ingredient to a good marriage, is having a mind of service. Having a mind of service. Now consider, when, we, when people get married, consider the vow that you take. Did you promise to love, honour, and keep them? Sickness as in health, in poverty as in wealth, forsaking all others, keep the only unto them as long as you both shall live. That is a promise to serve, isn't it? I'm going to love, honour, and keep you. And it wasn't that I'm going to love, honour, and keep you just when times are good, only if you love and honour and keep me. Was that the vow? No, the vow was service, because service is you serve even if you're not being served back. See? So we have to have the mind of service that we serve one another and we keep our vow because that is very important because when both want to be served, this is when it leads to a lot of conflict within a relationship because they're not getting served. They're not getting served. But if the mindset is to serve, there will be a lot of conflict avoided because the, my, the priority is not to do what I want or to get what I want, it's to please the other. And you're better off fighting over who's going to please the other than fighting over who's going to please themselves. Because generally, when you're fighting over who to please the other, that's a good marriage. That's great. That's, that's what a lot of people don't get to experience in their marriage. A lot of people experience the other when it's a fight over... I didn't get my way. You always get your way. Not a fight over. No, you do. I'm going to do your. Yeah, I say, you know, that's that's a, that's a good disagreement to have. You know, it shows that you love one another and you're both putting each other first. So you want to have that mind of service. And you know, it's for better, for worse. You know, sometimes you have to remind the world, remind Christians. You know, when we when we feel like you know a lot of marriages in this world feel like giving up. It's like you promised for better, for worse. This is the test now. You, you never tested that vow until now. Because if everything was good, when did you ever keep the promise for worse? Now that it's not going so well, now's the opportunity to keep that promise. Otherwise, you never were given that opportunity if everything was just going smooth. Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. I think this is the best passage that I love about, and this is why I call it a mind of service, because I get it from Philippians 2. See, let each esteem other better than themselves, in putting others before yourself. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So Jesus had a mind of service, he showed it to us by the things that I'm going to be talking about now. He's saying, you have this mind of service, which is you esteem other better than yourselves. You do, you know, you, what was it? you don't look every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Who being in the form of God, now talking about Jesus, this mind of service was in Jesus Christ. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What does that say? He was God in the flesh. So he knew who he was, but that didn't stop him from being humble. So it's the same when you're in a relationship and you know, you're trying to resolve things. You can know the stature or the, the hierarchy of the relationship. That doesn't mean it, you can't be humble when you're serving one another. He thought it not a robbery to be equal with God. That's saying that Jesus knew full well that he was equal with God the Father because he was God the Father in the flesh but made himself of no reputation. This is, the hu this is the humility now. Took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. 1 Corinthians 13. This is the famous love passage. And look, it's all about service. Charity suffereth long. Notice how love in the Bible... We emphasize this as Bible-believing Christians, that love is an action. It is not only an emotion. This is why when the world teaches that love is an emotion, they say, well, the love is no longer in, uh, you know, 
my, our relationship. It's gone because it's just the emotion's gone. And sometimes even famous people, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts recently, it's very, always very interesting to hear about their personal life, talk about their marriage, and then they just say, uh, how did you know when this person was the one for you? Or, you know, it's like, what is this, this is what I was thinking about. It's like, what is the secret, you know, in terms of making your marriage work? And it just, I just cringe when they're just like, I don't know, it's just, it's just, it's just all has worked together, it just all came together. You know? It's like as, though, as though they had no, control over it and I think if that mindset just permeates society this is why when people just throw their hands up and go oh see it just didn't work it just I just didn't have the luck that you had that we just like kind of clicked I'd love to hear you know some famous person when they talk about their marriage and they say hey what is the secret to a good marriage they say well the secret to a good marriage is service you make it work you know, it's, there is no just luck, chance, find my soulmate, they're the one. No, because you need these ingredients to make it work. And part of it is the serving. You actually, you actually put in the work to make it work. It takes work. Charity suffereth not and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. So you see there, it's about service, it's about humility, it's about not being offended, it's about giving people the benefit of the, of the doubt, it's being acting appropriately. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, it's not worldly, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things. See how it's supporting hopeth all things, endureth all things. See, it thinks the best, and it goes through the hard times together. That's charity. Service is a huge thing in the Christian life. This is how Jesus said, this is how you become great in the Christian life, is through service. Jesus called them to him and said unto them, you know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. He's saying, this is how the world works. The great ones get served. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So, service is a big thing. Service is a big thing in the Christian life. And uh, in the context of marriage, we'll touch on this point, but service is not only in just doing one thing, things for one another, but it also is referring to intimacy as well in service. And you have to have this mindset of service even in intimacy. 1 Corinthians 7. This is what 1 Corinthians 7 talks about. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So see, part of the reason why there is intimacy within a marriage is to help the other avoid fornication. That is a service that you do to the other. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now obviously, you know, this sort of talk is not always appropriate to talk about, but it is very important. You know, the world has perverted sex, but God created sex. Sex is very important in a relationship. So this is why, but you have to have the right mindset when it comes to it. And the Bible gives us the right mindset that is actually a service that husband and wife do for one another in order to build and have that good relationship. They are serving one another. So we don't serve just one another in deeds, but we also serve one another in intimacy as well. So when you serve, a good principle to always remember, we serve with joy. J-O-Y. Jesus first, others, and then you last. So we serve with joy. That's the, that's the uh, order it should be. 
Acts 20 is the last passage I'll, sh I'll show you. Acts 20, I've showed you all things, how that's so laboring, you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. So what are some ways in a relationship where you can serve one another? Well, one is, you know, take joy in pleasing your spouse and seeing them happy. Rather than focusing on what makes you happy and what you want out of life, hey, why don't you focus on what makes your spouse happy and then get pleasure out of seeing your spouse happy rather than the other way around. What about take an interest in your spouse's interests and take an interest in one another's things. That's one way you can serve one another. Another way you can have a mind of service is you focus more on what you can do differently in the relationship more than focusing on what the other person can do differently. So you can see how these principles can apply just to anything in life. You know, where is your focus? Is your focus on the beam in your own eye or the moat in your brother's eye? And that principle can apply to all sorts of relationships, but particularly in a marriage too. You know, ask yourself the question, how do I be the best partner to them? Not how can they be a better partner to me? So you see how it's just a flick in the perception and the perspective. When you have a mind of service, you're more focused on what you're doing rather than on what the other person's doing. That doesn't mean that what the other person's doing is not important. It doesn't make a difference. You're saying what is more important, what's more important, or what, the way the focus should be is what you're doing. All right, so we'll end it there, but so just some closing thoughts, just going back to what I said at the beginning of this sermon. These are the secret ingredients to a good marriage, I believe firmly. Having those same beliefs and values. You know, having shared goals, being able to communicate, and serving one another. You know, previously when I've preached sermons on this, I've talked about, you know, overcoming conflict and uh, intimacy and all these sorts of things. But I, when I reflect on it, these are really the next level. So this is why when I talked about, you know, having peace in a marriage, yes, that's a good marriage, but you can't have peace without unity and a way to resolve conflict. And this is why when you have peace without purity, it's, it's like a false peace. You can just never talk to one another and you can just like not associate with one another at all, just do different things. And there's, there's an absence of conflict in the home. But is that the sort of unity that God wants in a marriage? That's why when you want true godly peace, it can only be achieved with these ingredients. And this is why they, they're so important. Think about trust. You say, it'll be great if the marriage has trust. But how, can, how do you build trust in a relationship? Can you just say, you know, you, you try that? Hey, just trust them. What? But you, why don't you trust them? Is it because they said they would do something in the past and they didn't? Is it because you don't really know what they're thinking? Is it because you have different values? So how can you trust to have your interest or that goal in, in the same? Because why? There's no trust there because the foundational ingredients are not there in order to start building trust. You build trust through your actions, through serving one another, through, I said I'm going to do that, I do it, and you start building trust. All right, you had a conflict, you talk through it, the trust gets built. So you see how you can't just say a good marriage has trust without really telling people what is needed in order to build that trust. And again, a good marriage is a marriage, obviously, that is enjoyable. But when you don't have the same values and beliefs, you don't have shared goals, you can't talk to one another, you're constantly selfish in how you go about your... That's not a marriage that's going to be joyful. And this is why 75% of marriages end in divorce, probably, and even, you know, let's say, let's make up some statistics right now, 95% of marriages, 99% of marriages, just don't enjoy, just don't have the level of joy in their relationship that God actually intended for marriage because they do not have these secret ingredients that the Bible talks about when it comes to having a good relationship. So like I said, it really isn't, it really isn't anything different to any good relationship. Now whether it's friendship or business, I just think it's very unfortunate that people will 
learn and know these principles and teach it and apply it in their professional careers and their businesses. You know, you will see people online. They know that if they're going to have a successful business or a successful working relationship, this is required. And it's just unfortunate that they don't apply the same principles in their marriage. And it's almost like you will do it for money, but you won't do it for the sake of your family and for your children. And I think that's very unfortunate in the world that even a lot of successful people do not have a good marriage. But let's not have that happen here. You know, so you can, we can you know, apply these principles not only in marriage, but in re relationships. But you know, let's not make sure we've got it all in order in our careers and in our working relationships. And yet when it comes to the relationships within this church, the relationships with our husband and wife and relationships within our families, that all those principles <laughs> then go out the window. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for uh, your word and thank you that you are the perfect example of all these principles, giving us your word so that we can know what you believe, you know, giving us goals, communicating with us through your word, Jesus Christ coming to this world and serving us, Lord, like Jesus had the mind of service. I pray, Lord, you know, I'm not perfect either. These principles are always harder to do than, than to talk about. I pray, Lord, that you give us the grace. At least now we can have the knowledge, have these be armed or be reminded of these secret ingredients, the secret to a good marriage and good relationship. And I pray, Lord, you uh, help us to apply these principles in our own lives. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.